The Tom Woods Show, episode 2362. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, believing that the end of the world might be a bad thing that we should try to avoid is not a Russian talking point. But if we are going to avoid World War III, it's important for Americans to understand what's been left out of the CIA's narrative about Russia and Ukraine. Coming to the rescue here is my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Ukraine. Pick it up at wrongaboutukraine.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Yes, I'm broadcasting to you in this brief opening message from the <laughs> built-in microphone on my computer. But that's because I'm in London at the moment, and my wonderful audio person, Chris Williams, reminded me that I never recorded any kind of intro for the episode you're about to hear. This is an episode that's drawn from a podcast network called The Old Glory Club, and I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 2362. But it's got a bunch of episodes on history, and I'm interviewed for this one by Pete Canonas. And the topic begins as the topic of nullification, state nullification of unconstitutional federal law. So we take that in quite a variety of unexpected places. So I hope you enjoy what you're about to hear. Here we go. I want to welcome everyone back to another episode of the Old Glory Club. I'm happy to have Tom Woods with us today. How are you doing, Tom? Doing great, Pete. Thanks for having me. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. This might be a new environment for you. So. Well, the credentials I have are the kinds of credentials that will make people want to turn this off, unfortunately, (laughs) especially with all that's been going on with Harvard, with the uh, recent Supreme Court decision. I'm just more and more ashamed to say that I graduated from there, but I did. And by the way, we got an email, all the alumni, we got an email, yeah, (laughs) saying, oh, what a terrible day this is. And, And I actually, you can reply to that email. And I replied and said, why are you treating us all as subhuman if we disagree? I, I think it's a great day. You know, well, why do you just automatically assume all the alumni agree with you? I think it's a great day. And then they also said in the email, I, I'm sorry, it's a very roundabout way of introducing myself. But they, also, they also said in the email that no aspect of us, of what makes us who we are, is irrelevant. You know, so in other words, race can't be irrelevant. So I said, well, great. I can't wait to see your special recruitment drive for traditionalist Catholics, you know, because that's a big part of what makes them who they are. And they have a completely marginalized perspective. And I know you love those. So let me know how that goes. And he, you know, they don't respond to me. They should drop me from the list, but they don't. Anyway, so I went there. Then I have a PhD from Columbia. So the two institutions that have destroyed America, I elbowed my way in one way or another. But I kind of put myself on the map, not with my first couple of books, one of which was rather academic. But in uh, late 2004, I wrote The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, which is coming up on its 20th anniversary. And I may do a, uh, you know, bring it up to date chapter because a lot's happened in the past 20 years, Pete. That'd be great. <laughs> you know, so anyway, so that, but that book really put me on the map. Uh, New York Times bestseller for 12 weeks. People loved it or hated it. All the bad guys hated it. And I mean, bad guys not like the obvious, like the New York Times, they didn't like it. But let's just say certain bad guys in my general wing, let's say. But after that, I yeah, I wrote books for quite a while. I was at the Mises Institute as a senior fellow, scholar in residence for four years. But since then, I've had the Tom Woods Show, which is my podcast that's been running about 10 years, had a couple thousand episodes of that. I keep busy doing a lot of things. I helped to create the Ron Paul homeschool curriculum. And let's just say I keep busy. Yep. Yes, you certainly do. Wouldn't it be nice to have an alma mater that you'd want to send money to and support? (laughs) I know. It's I know I know what I mean. And the thing is, they yeah, I got a decent amount of financial aid. They don't have academic based aid. They just help you out depending on your income. And I came from a modest middle class background. And so they footed a lot of the bill. And being not a parasite, I kind of feel bad about that in a way. Like I would like to make good on that, but I just can't. I mean, if they're going to be at war with me, then they deserve to be stuck with the bill. Well, it seems like they have a pretty good war chest from what I've heard. Oh, do they ever? Do they ever? They don't. I mean, Ron Unz says that they could easily get by not charging any tuition whatsoever. They actually could. That's how big it is. Yeah. 
All right. Well, one of those books you wrote and the guys here at OGC wanted to do a episode on nullification. So, I mean, who else? Stephen Carson's one of the OGC guys. So, you know, I'm sure he was the one who was like, Woods. Yeah, Woods. He's been a good friend. Has he ever edited anything that you wrote? <laughs> he mu- It's possible he did a proofread of something that I did as yeah. I think back on it, but it's been a long time. Yeah, actually interviewing him in a couple hours. But you wrote a book called Nullification. Nullification. Yeah, and there's a book I have. I don't have it here. It's at the new house or else I would hold it up. <laughs> I'm going to hold it up. Wait a minute. <laughs> there we go. Yep. There it is, Nullification. Yep. Yeah, I have a copy of that myself. I have read it, actually. Good. Yes. Well, when people hear nullification, especially in today's environment, it means a lot of things, but usually it's portrayed as something negative. Why don't you tell me what nullification is? Well, first of all, here's what it isn't. It's not jury nullification. That's a separate issue. You can have another conversation about that. This is state nullification. This is the idea that a state should not only refuse to enforce, but perhaps even actively thwart the enforcement of an unconstitutional law within their borders. So that's what it's all about. So you hear that, and you've been trained to think this must be evil, because we all know that smaller political units are evil, and big centralized regimes are good. And the smaller units are always trying to exert their powers for disreputable purposes, And thankfully, according to the progressive version of history, we have these centralized regimes that come in and smack them down when they try to do this. Well, it's almost impossible to have a conversation when people have that background. And one of my favorite memories about all this, actually, Pete, comes from I was invited to speak at the Yale Political Union, where there's some controversial issue that you're going to come defend against all comers. And that means that students can come up and speak on behalf of what you've said or against what you've said. So I actually went to Yale and argued for the right of a state to secede from the union. Now, that's different from nullification, but it follows the same kind of principle that the state has an existence of its own. It's not just an administrative unit of the central government. And it was so interesting to hear these elite students get up there and try to lecture me with like a third grade level lecture about racism and slavery because they thought those magic words will just shut me up. And I just murdered them, Pete. But I murdered them with a smile on my face and jokes coming out of my mouth. And I charmed the whole room. And I ended up winning the point two to one in an audience of Yale students. I won the point two to one that state should have the right to seat. (laughs) You think that would happen now? I wonder. I might have to pack that audience to get that result now. I'm not so sure. But on the other hand, I think it might, if I framed it a little different, I think there's a possibility that playing to that audience, I could say, look, you guys are all sick and tired of dealing with backwoods hicks in your view, right? They don't want the national health care that you want, and they don't want this and that. But you could have that tomorrow. You could have it tomorrow. You know, and maybe there are enough of them who might be swept away by my manipulative appeal. <laughs> So nullification, is it written into the Constitution? Where does the idea come from? Okay, so it's not in the Constitution. But on the other hand, we should remember that pretty much almost nothing that we have the right to do is written in the Constitution. There's nothing saying you have the right to have a family. You know, there's nothing (laughs) that says you have the right to have, I was going to say, a certain number of people at your funeral. But as we've seen, (laughs) apparently you don't have that right. The idea of the Constitution is that it lists the things the the government can do. It doesn't list the things we can do because that list would go on forever. The presumption is that you can do things. And so, whereas the government does not have that presumption. So the Tenth Amendment more or less says that anything that's not mentioned in here, we presume rests with the states and the people. That's the arrangement. So nullification, in fact, is embedded in the very nature of the union. That's more or less the argument. So Thomas Jefferson's view was spelled out nowhere better than in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 and the somewhat, maybe even slightly more radical Kentucky Resolutions of 1799. Now, those came out right around the time of the death of George Washington. So they were mostly overlooked because of that. But all the same, the gist of Jefferson's argument was, we have this federal government. These are all things we've all heard a million times. But just what's interesting is, the conclusion Jefferson draws from it. 
we have this federal government with enumerated powers. It has only the powers delegated to it. And the 10th Amendment says that the states retain and the people everything else. But then Jefferson goes to the next point. Well, that's not self-enforcing. I mean, there aren't fangs that come out of the Constitution if the federal government goes beyond what it's allowed to do. So how do we keep this kind of equilibrium between the states and the federal government so that one doesn't swallow up the other? And the answer is there has to be enforcement teeth for the 10th Amendment. And that comes with the states. And why? Because they are the parties to the Constitution. The United States is not just one undifferentiated mass of individuals. It is made up of constituent parts. It's made up of individual societies, namely the states. And we know that because of the way it was ratified. It was not ratified in one single national vote of, end quote, American people. They're strictly speaking. I mean, John C. Calhoun was the one who had the guts to come out and say it. He actually came out and said, there is no such thing as the American people. We have the people of Massachusetts. We have the people of Virginia. We have the people of South Carolina. We have the people of Pennsylvania. There is no American people. That's just an invention. So what follows from this is that the states who created the Constitution, it's not right to say that the Constitution is a contract between the federal government and the states. That's not correct because how could the federal government enter into a contract that created itself? It wasn't in existence at that point. So instead, the Constitution is a compact among the states creating a federal government. So Dr. Frankenstein, in principle, has authority over the Frankenstein monster because he's the creator. And likewise, the states have to have control over this federal government. Now, James Madison even said in the Virginia report of 1800 that we can't assume that we have two fallible branches of the federal government and then one infallible one, namely the judiciary, that, oh, don't worry, the judiciary will solve this. If the federal government goes too far, don't worry, the courts will step in. But you know what? What if they don't? What if all three branches gang up on the public? I mean, we offer this to you, Pete, as a hypothetical situation. But what if all three branches gang up on the people? Then what do we do then? Well, then in the last resort, it's up to the creators of the union to step in and say, we can't allow this because we never gave you the power to do it. Any other approach to this question assumes that the federal government has a monopoly on interpreting what its powers are. But we can obviously tell what would happen if it had such a monopoly. It will interpret every controversy in its own favor because there's nobody available to say no to it. So that's more or less the thinking behind it. You mentioned the 10th Amendment, Tom. Sometimes when you mention the 10th Amendment, when you say the phrase states' rights, you will have people jump in and go, well, states don't have any rights because they're not individuals. Only individuals have rights. How do you answer that? First, like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, Jefferson used the term. So I'm pretty sure he knew what was meant by it. I'm sure he would not say states have rights per se. What he means by that is that he's just using a shorthand term to refer to the relationship between the states and the federal government. That's all he means, that if the federal government is not delegated a certain power, then the power is reserved by the states. That is to say, if the federal government tried to wrench it away from the state, the federal government would be perpetrating a wrong against the state. Because in our constitutional system, the state retains power over whatever that issue is. Now, we may then go further and say, I don't even want the states to have this power. Well, that's correct too. But the states have their own existences. They have their own state constitutions and bills of rights. And they're not absorbed into the federal government. That is all he's saying, that there are some matters, in fact, most matters, that are beyond the power of the federal government to carry out. And if the federal government carries them out, then they are violating the rights of the states. And the thing is, most of the people saying this are not ANCAPs. So they don't actually believe that no state has the power to do anything. Most of them are minarchists or bigger government people. So if they think that some level of government has the power to have a police force or something, well, if the federal government federalized the police force, that would be violating the rights of the states. That's basically what's meant. Okay. So you mentioned, I think it was that the Virginia resolution was more radical. What was the... Oh, the 1799 Kentucky resolution oh, the 17, was a little okay. bit more radical than the 1798 one. Okay, so 
what was it about? The only major difference is that there was a clarification in 1799 in which the word nullification was actually used in 1799. In 1798, Jefferson had included that word, but one of his friends advised against its use, thinking that it would just make people go berserk and it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. So he got rid of it. But in 1799, it's in there, the word nullification. And this is an interesting point because in later years, James Madison tried to obscure the nature of what had gone on during those years because Madison had grown more nationalistic over time. And he didn't want to be associated with nullification, even though he'd been the principal drafter of the Virginia Resolution, 1798. Now, those had used the term interposition, which to my mind is still tomato, tomato, because interposition refers to a state standing in between the federal government and the people to prevent an unconstitutional law from being carried out. Well, that, sorry, that sounds like nullification to me. And maybe the word isn't as arresting, I suppose, but it sounds like nullification to me. In fact, when Daniel Webster during the War of 1812 said that if the federal government tries to engage in military conscription, this would be a grotesque violation of the Constitution. This is the nationalist Daniel Webster, by the way, who in the webster hain debates in 1830 was arguing for the single consolidated union. Even he said the federal government cannot do that and it would be up to the states to interpose their authority to prevent that being carried out. Well, again, that to me, that sounds like nullification. But Madison tried to obscure this and play with words. And then he tried to claim that this is like in the 1830s. He's getting old and we'll get to this later. There was a nullification controversy going on then. And he's trying to say, I, we had nothing to do with this. Jefferson had nothing to do with this. Jefferson never used the word nullification. That's what he tried to say. And then a copy of the Kentucky Resolutions of 1799 in Jefferson's own handwriting was presented to him. Well, there it is, you lying SOP. There it is. So that is why it matters that that word, for some reason, was like radioactive. And so to have Jefferson actually have uttered it makes it a little easier to get away with saying it today. One of the things that we do here most of the time is we usually pick a subject, go a little bit with it, get the gist of it, and then we just start going off on rabbit trails. But before we start going off on rabbit trails, talk a little bit about the 1832. This one is actually called a crisis. Yeah. When you look it up in history. So this goes back to the issue of the South and protective tariffs. And the long and the short of it is that the Southern states felt like the protective tariff was a benefit only to the North and not to them. And it only hurt them. And so there was an argument advanced. Now this, I'm not entirely convinced that they're right, but at the very least they had a case for it, which was they argued that what they called the tariff of abominations, which was a very recently enacted tariff that was giving them no relief from what they'd been suffering for some time was really the last straw, but beyond that, actually unconstitutional. How could they say that? Obviously, the Constitution authorizes the levying of tariffs, but their argument was that the purpose of tariffs is supposed to be as a revenue device. And secondly, we have that the Constitution twice referring to the general welfare, that the federal government's actions need to be aimed at bringing about the general welfare. So they argued against the protective tariff on both of these grounds. They said, number one, the protective tariff is not intended to bring in revenue. I mean, obviously, like if we were to put a 200% tariff on imported cars, we wouldn't start licking our chops at how rich the government was going to get from that. Nobody would buy those cars. So it's the purpose of that is something other than the raising of revenue. So number one, they said it's not clear that that's what the Constitution had in mind when it talked about levying tariffs. But secondly, obviously, this is a measure that does not benefit the general welfare. It benefits one section of the country at the expense of another. So they tried to argue that it was unconstitutional. And therefore, they were going to try to actively thwart its enforcement. Now, you can talk about freedom of speech in the 1790s, which is what nullification was first devised to defend. It was devised as a defense mechanism against the Alien and Sedition Acts, which were offenses against the freedom of speech. You can talk about that, and you can have that conversation, and you can talk about this, that, or the other thing, unconstitutional searches and seizures. These are a number of issues that nullification had been threatened over. 
But if you start talking about cutting off the tariffs, now that's just, yeah, now we're just not doing that. So that led to a showdown with Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was good on some things and bad on others. And he was bad on this. And so there was a force bill that authorized the federal government to go in and use force if the nullification was ever actually really carried out. Now, Calhoun, eventually he was replaced as vice president, became Martin Van Buren, but he was the vice president. And he eventually went back into the U.S. Senate and he was arguing in favor of the nullification. And his approach, he was very specific as to exactly how nullification would be carried out. He felt like something so grave as this should be carried out in a way that's analogous to how the ratification of the Constitution was carried out. Well, how was that carried out? The states held ratifying conventions. And in Republican theory of that time, the convention, the specially called convention, was considered to be the instrument through which the voice of the people was most reliably heard, the convention, the specially elected convention. So we would have a nullification convention, just like we had for ratifying the Constitution. And his view was that if even one state doesn't have to be a majority, doesn't have to be a significant minority, if even one state says that a federal measure is unconstitutional, then that measure should be considered as suspended until we resolve this matter. And we resolve this matter by discussing it by either, so let's say there is some constitutionally ambiguous thing and one or a number of states said, we refuse to enforce this because of its dubious constitutionality. One way out of that would be to amend the constitution to either clearly grant or clearly prohibit the exercise of this power by the federal government. And then at that point, the side that loses can decide, can you live with this new arrangement now where it's been clarified? Or you can secede from the union if this is just a step too far. That was how he envisioned it being carried out. So eventually what happened is that Henry Clay stepped in and worked out kind of a compromise whereby the tariff would be lowered to bring about relief for the South, but it would be lowered gradually over time so as to give the North time to adjust the new arrangement. And that more or less brought an end to it. Can you give examples of how nullification was used successfully back then when it wasn't a national emergency or tragedy, as some people would call it? What I think it generally did was remind the federal government that if it presses too hard, it might wind up in a battle it can't win. And so I think in a way it averted crises when the states would say, we're considering nullifying this. So the states interfered or New England states were afraid that Jefferson's embargo, which was fruitless, that he enacted to try to get the British and French to stop interfering with American trade, they felt like his approach to that would make the situation even worse. And so there was talk about nullifying that. And eventually, Madison, they tried every combination. We're going to try this policy, that policy, that policy. Maybe it's possible they didn't try military conscription because one of the best known members of the U.S. Congress stood up and said, if you try that, we're going to fight you every step of the way. We're going to resist you. Well, in that day and age, there was no doubt that they would have done it. Today, you wonder, well, most people don't know any American history, so they'll probably think it's treason to engage in nullification. But in that time, I don't think they doubted that could actually be carried out. Or I think the nullification in the case of 1798 over the Alien and Sedition Acts, I think it brought national attention to those issues. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Jefferson was then elected president in 1800. And then he released everybody who had been incarcerated over that. And he refunded everybody's fines that they had had to pay with interest. So I think it also accomplished that. Now, also, it had the salutary effect of revealing to the country that the New England states were against Virginia and Kentucky nullifying the Alien Sedition Acts, not because they thought nullification was unconstitutional or all this high horse nonsense, but I believe there were, so Virginia and Kentucky issued their resolutions, and then a number of states, it was seven or eight states, issued their own responses to Virginia and Kentucky, and in those responses, all but one of those states came out and actively endorsed the Alien and Sedition Acts. So the real reason 
they were against Virginia and Kentucky nullifying them is that they thought it was just fine to imprison you for criticizing John Adams. They wanted to do it. So then when you look at it, you know, because if you read in your textbook, and these bastards have done this in basically every American textbook, it says Virginia and Kentucky failed to get any other state to side with them. Well, you know what? Let's look at that more, more closely. Why didn't they side with them? Because they wanted to throw you in jail for criticizing John Adams. Did you forget to put that in the textbook? Because that might make that side of the argument a little more dishonorable. So therefore, it's not even in there. Now, it doesn't surprise me. At this point, I'm so utterly unimpressed with American historians. It wouldn't surprise me if none of them even know that. If none of them even bothered to look at what the other states were saying. They were all cheering for this. Well, would you say that the war is what basically... I mean, how much nullification happened after the war or even threats of it? It's after the war, it seems like the unionization, the, you know, these United States becoming the United States was just sealed. And now it would become, if you do that, slavery is going to be thrown in your face. Or yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't see it much. I mean, you do see some half-hearted efforts at the time of forced integration, basically, but that didn't really go anywhere. So yeah, so it basically fell more or less into disuse. But the argument is that the points we make about it are still the same. They were never refuted. You don't refute arguments through violence. So if your kid gets beaten up at the park, you don't say to your kid, well, I guess you were wrong. And what would a a deranged thing to say? We'd never think that way. Or if Stalin and Stalin's forces, let's say, had somehow invaded South Korea and been victorious, we wouldn't have said, well, Guess the South Koreans had it coming to them. I mean, this is not the way we think in any other situation. But in this case, because of the propaganda, you get people saying, well, we fought a war over that. What are you talking about? First of all, we didn't fight a war over nullification. Secondly, Jefferson Davis, in his farewell address to the Senate, criticized nullification because he thought the North was misusing it when it came to the fugitive slave law. So it's all a whole lot of confusion. But the Union is still like the states never acceded to any change in the definition of the union. Yeah, they got reconstruction and they got all kinds of incoherent constitutional doctrines thrown at them, but they've never been asked to ratify a different constitution. So if the arguments were good then, they're still good today. And also it's worth noting that if you look at, I mean, it's important to contextualize documents from the 18th century. Like, for example, a lot of times people will say the union is a perpetual union. And they speak about this language. They say that there were references to the Constitution being perpetual and the Union being perpetual. But perpetual in the 18th century didn't mean lasting forever. Because if that were true, then we'd still have the Articles of Confederation. Because that was called the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. All it meant was there was no built-in sunset provision. That's all that meant. So it's important to be precise with language. Well, the reason I bring this up is in 1758, there was a extremely influential international lawyer named Emmerich de Vittel, who said that if a sovereign state joins a confederation, it does not yield the powers that it had when it was a sovereign state outside the confederation. It may simply choose not to exercise those powers for a particular period of time for some greater purpose, but it doesn't lose its sovereignty. It's always sovereign. The people of that state are always sovereign. So the mere fact that you join a union does not compromise the fullness of your sovereignty. If that confederation that you join exercises certain powers, they exercise those powers at your sufferance. Okay, that's not because they inherently have them. So given that, well, again, nothing has changed. What we had was the peoples of all these states acceding to the Constitution. So they're just as sovereign as they ever were, according to the international lawyer's at the time the Constitution was ratified. And since there's been no official change, nothing's been ratified to the contrary since then, then the arguments still are good. And telling me that they were defeated in war is not an argument. That shows they don't even know how to debate you. Hey, everybody, a quick message from our friends at Blinkist. There are only so many hours in the day, and yet you encounter a lot of people who seem to be super-duper informed about so many things, and you think, They have the same number of hours in the day that I have. How are they acquiring all this knowledge? How are they so impressive? How can they speak about this and this and this and this? And they seem to do so with authority. They know all the main points. They know all the arguments. How do they become those people? Well, I'll tell you one great way to do so with the Blinkist app. Blinkist takes nonfiction books in 27 different categories and gives you what they call blinks. That is 
15-minute summaries you can read or listen to. And I'm talking about fields as diverse as science, entrepreneurship, parenting, money and investments, biographies, religion, politics, health and nutrition, history, career, personal development, philosophy, you name it. So if I'm driving around town and it takes 30 minutes to reach my destination, 30 minutes to get back home, I can have consumed the equivalent of four books. Well, that could be you. And imagine that brain after those four books. Not only will you yourself be enriched, but you will become the kind of person other people consider indispensable. And now listen to this. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Let's bring this all the way forward to today. So, I mean, I think I asked you to come on the show, my show, back in like March of 2020 to talk about nullification because, you know, we both saw what was coming. So since 2020, the state you live in and other states have seemed to have embraced it again, at least in the spirit of it when it came to you know, well, definitely COVID. So yeah, I think both of us were like, when we did that show, we were like, if you would have told us in January that in March, we were going to be talking about federalism, <laughs> federalism becoming a thing, we, you, know, you would have told you you were crazy. Yeah. 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 I have to say, I mean, that was, even though that whole COVID period was a huge black pill, the white pill part of it was that we discovered that if we ever really do want to have federalism again, it's just sitting there waiting for us. The problem was we didn't have enough people who wanted their governors to release their shackles. They wanted to be shackled. But there were a couple of them who were pretty good. Now, most Republicans were as useless as they always are. But I will say, despite what people think about Ron DeSantis today, I still think he did a lot of really important things. And he... Let me me interrupt you. Because it's funny because we were talking about this before we started. May 1st, 2020, we had lunch in Atlanta. Do you yeah. remember why we had because we couldn't Atlanta? have it in Florida? Yeah, <laughs> you still it was takeout only in Florida. Yeah. So I had to drive to, and the reason I saw you at that lunch, the reason I was up there was that as soon as Georgia opened, my my well, I guess we weren't married just yet, but we were together at least, and we just said we got to get out of here. We got to go eat at a restaurant somewhere. So we drove up to Georgia, <laughs> and so while we were there, we said, eh, "What the heck?" And I remember actually. I had lunch at a sandwich shop while I was up there. I took a picture of my sandwich. I posted it to Twitter. And I believe it is the most liked and retweeted tweet I've ever had. It was a sandwich, Pete. It was a sandwich. Well, when we took a picture at the table, and when I put that out on Facebook, I mean, people were like, where, the, where is this happening? <laughs> <laughs> I know it. I know it. I know it. So it's interesting, though, that DeSantis elevated some of the very voices that we now know were being actively suppressed. And then the day before he said, all right, it's phase whatever, which is every restriction is lifted. The day before that, he had a round table with Bhattacharya and all the usual names. And they were all saying, yeah, you got to do this. There's no reason to have these restrictions. I knew why he was doing that. He was preparing the way so that he could say, look, these super credential people say it. What I didn't know was it was going to be the next day. He covered his ass with that event and then the next day. And so I know there are people who are nitpicking him now or they're saying, you know, and I know he's got baggage, believe me. But the thing is, it is hard for me as a father of five daughters living in Florida not to appreciate the fact that their lives weren't ruined and they weren't traumatized by crazy, insane BS. And so that did go to show what federalism could do. But remember, there were rumors coming out of the Biden White House And rumors don't come out by accident. Like, these are trial balloons. And there was a rumor that they were considering restricting travel to Florida because it was just too dangerous for people to go there. And I remember thinking that would be out of this world crazy. And DeSantis said that, now, I don't know what would happen in the actual event, but he said that he would defy that. Like, there was just no way he would let that happen. And I remember thinking this would be a fascinating constitutional showdown to observe We didn't get that. But yeah, we did see. But not only with COVID, 
I do want to say a word on behalf of somebody I've been good friends with for a long time, and that's Michael Bolden from the 10th Amendment Center. I mean, Michael Bolden started the 10th Amendment Center during the George W. Bush years when the conservative movement, if you know, whatever you want to call it, the losers, the last thing in the world they wanted to hear was defying the federal government. What? One of our people is in there. What? And so then when he was still doing this under Obama, the left-wingers would say, well, I bet you weren't doing this under George W. Bush. He'd say, yeah, I, I was, because this is what I believe in. I don't want this regime micromanaging the whole country. But the 10th Amendment Center has a, I don't know, I mean, 10th Amendment Center doesn't sound super confrontational, but it's dedicated to nullification. That really is what it is. And they have model legislation. And it's not all taking the form of, we absolutely defy you. Sometimes it's lesser things like, well, sometimes it is defy you. Like before Trump did it, there were states that were passing a right to try law that if there's an experimental drug and you're going to die anyway and you want to see if it works, you should be able to see if it works. So some states just went ahead and did that. Obviously, the marijuana thing, just some states just went ahead and did it. And technically, they're not allowed to do that. They just went ahead and did that. There have been a number of other issues like the Defend the Guard bill in which states are going to recall their National Guards back to their state if they're engaged in wars that are undeclared. There was Michael's friend, Mike Meharry, who's the communications director of the 10th Amendment Center, who's very concerned about NSA surveillance and so on. I mean, you have to assume part of the reason that some of these people in Congress are so feckless is that they've got something on them. I mean, you just have to figure that nobody could be that spineless. So it's a concern, these things are a concern. So the main facility is in Utah. So Mike came up with the idea, it turns out that they use water to cool their machinery. It's a very common thing, but use... I mean, it's an astronomical amount of water that they need. And Meharry said, what if we shut the water off? What if Utah just shuts off the water? There's no constitutional obligation for them to give water to anybody. And so they started the off now campaign. It did not succeed. But you think about all these supposedly right-wing think tanks that blow a hundred million bucks a year on God knows what, they would never rally around something like that because it's not respectable. What will the New York Times think? But here's a shoestring organization that got on CBS News talking about this strategy. So, I mean, just think, if we had people with some stones in any of these places, we might actually be getting somewhere. Yeah, no, 100%. Going forward, I mean, we, you know, we've talked about it. We, uh, a couple months ago, watched and commented on Pepe Cannon's culture war speech from 1992. And we're looking at this culture war now that basically seems to be consuming all. And people may not want to believe this because yeah, I hear a lot of people say, we really should be concentrating on the wars. We should be concentrating on what's going on overseas. It seems like a lot of this is pushing it overseas as well, that this has something to do. I mean, why would there be a George Floyd mural in Kabul? Why would they be teaching women's studies to Afghani girls if this wasn't a whole part of it going forward when you look at this and with the trans insanity how do you see this playing out do you see that nullification can be something and <laughs> what do you see as the likelihood in our lifetime that we're going to see a state just go you know what bye we're done with this you know it's funny pete that calls to mind exactly what you just said a minute ago that in january of 2020 <laughs> we couldn't have predicted what we were going to be talking about in March of 2020, <laughs> you know? And then secondly, I couldn't have predicted that the Bud Light boycott would have been successful because there are so many of these boycotts that just fizzle out. And that happened. I think there is a backlash beneath the surface because it's not anybody famous involved in it. It's just regular people. There's a backlash against some of the craziness that's building. I saw a poll recently saying that, and I don't know what this term means to people, but that social conservatism was growing to like its highest level in, I don't know, 15 years. I forget what the thing was. And I think that's entirely in reaction to what there's. I don't think these people are probably not all Bishop Fulton Sheen exactly, but they feel like what they're seeing today is just way too much. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was talking with my friend Jacob the other day, and he's saying, because he's younger, and he's seeing it in the Zoomers. It's the young people who are rebelling against this 
And you know, what's funny is when I look at like the people who follow me on Twitter, so many of them are really, really young. And it's, that gives me hope. Now, of course, those are people in their twenties and we're looking at people in their teens who are just falling absolute victim to this insanity, this new religion that the government has declared. But if the people in their twenties, if the ones that can get elected pretty soon to office are embracing social conservatism, at least that's something to hold on to. Yeah. I mean, and again, even by social conservatism, if it just means they reject fact-free gender theory, I'll take that. We'll work on other issues later. I'll take that. And really, if, as long as it just means, you know, I know, Pete, I get your thing about is people who say, mind your own business are always going to lose to people who just want to ram things down people's throats. But I think the people ramming the things down people's throats are starting to hit some resistance to that. And I think there are people who ordinarily wouldn't even want to be involved in anything like this. Like, I don't have time for this. This is stupid. Why am I wasting my time on this? But the answer is because I have no choice at this point. I think there is, at the very least, a growing number of people who do want to be left alone, but they don't mean that in some wimpy, non-judgmental way. It's, I specifically want to be left alone by you crazy people. And in fact, did you see the videos the other day from, I'm sorry, I don't remember what state it was, but there was some school district where they were going to teach crazy nonsense to kids. Yeah. And there was a huge protest, and it was probably three quarters immigrant, yes. like three quarters non-whites who, you know, the progressives didn't quite count on this, that the people they're admitting haven't all taken Professor So-and-So's gender studies course. And they have this crazy idea that maybe they should have some say about what their kids learn. Well, that kind of turned out a little bit differently from how they thought. Yeah, I saw a protest in Canada where it was a bunch of Muslims who were protesting this as well. Yeah. They were coming out and they're like, no, we're not, we're not going to put up with this. And I'm surprised this took this long. I really couldn't understand how the left could be so pro-Islam and not acknowledge that Islam is a worldview that is utterly opposed to yours in every particular. They're illiberal. I mean, they're illiberal. I mean, they're not liberal. I mean, they're... Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> they don't talk about universal human rights. No. <laughs> no. And, you know, that's... You know, some people might argue that's a little bit of people who aren't talking about that and who don't believe in that and a little bit of what needs to be in these people's faces right now so that they can have a little bit of fear. Yeah, you know, that's the thing is they present themselves as not having any fear because their people are in charge. So as soon as they meet somebody who is like, I'm not apologizing for what I believe. Yeah. Your words don't affect me. Yeah. You can call me X and Y, yeah. but that doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. These words are meaningless. And anybody whose opinion I care about knows these words are meaningless. Like it, do, it does not matter. If you're called a racist today, that doesn't even matter. Anymore. Yeah. There was a time when that might've hurt you, but that does not matter. I mean, yeah. Okay. If you're trying to get a job in academia and they do a search for you and everything says you're a racist. Yeah. Okay. But you know, academia is different at this point. There's a huge number of Americans who just roll their eyes and say, okay, so you're just a normal person then. Yeah. Yeah, but you're just a normal person who, by the way, has nothing but goodwill toward other people, wants everyone in the world to be happy and successful, just doesn't want to be propagandized 24 hours a day. Yeah. Well, and it's also one of those things where it's really, really online. I mean, you know where I live. You used to live where I live. I mean, you would expect to see it here. And it's like, for the first time the other day, I saw a woman in like Kroger who had a shirt that said, read banned books. And I mean, she wasn't talking about like the kind of books that, you know, you write <laughs> or, you know, they want to ban that you write or that we might have in our secret library. But she's talking about, oh, these books about CRT, they're being taken out of primary school libraries. So it's not real life. By the way, these are the libraries of schools where they don't teach CRT, remember? Remember yeah, yeah. that? They don't, yeah. they don't actually teach it. <laughs> However, put our books back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but when you go to big cities, you might see this. But, I mean, I don't live in a big city anymore. Wherever I go, I'm not seeing this. You don't see this in real life. This is social media, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the tool of where 
whoever comes up with these memes, these memetics that they want to go out about trans people and about trans genocide, all these things are created. But once you get out into the real world and you start talking to people, that just disappears. So, you know, I've been trying to spend a whole lot more time offline lately. Yeah, I know. I've really given thought over the past few years to something I'm sure you've also thought of, but I didn't think of it until just a few years ago, which is on net, maybe my life is worse with social media. Now, I know that almost sounds so oh, naive, like Tom, how could, yeah, we all absolutely. know that. But that was hard for me to see because on the surface, you would think like with something like Facebook, I genuinely enjoy keeping up with what some of my old friends from high school are up to. Like if it was just that, there's obviously no harm in that. But Twitter's not really where you keep up with friends from high school. No. That's not what it's for. People aren't really sharing family photos and stuff that much. So instead, it's like constant agitation, constant agitation and being reminded constantly of how dumb so many people are and how unreachable they are. And I'm only on there because, I mean, I would be crazy not to promote what I'm doing, given that I don't have my own show on television, so I got to use what I've got. But a lot of times I try to use my Twitter feed to get ideas for my newsletter. And the problem is that even though I've curated my Twitter feed pretty well to be only good people, sometimes my good people are arguing with bad people. So I see the arguments and I get drawn in. And I don't want to. Be, I'm just trying to find ideas for my newsletter. You know, so <laughs> it's incredible to me because if you were to describe it in the abstract and say, here's a way people from all over the world can have a conversation or can alert you immediately to an event taking place or whatever. You can see things unfold in real time. You think, boy, this sounds amazing. But then the way it's actually turned out, it is so polarizing and tribalistic in the worst possible way that you think, ah, oh, but you know, I mean, I'm so far into it, I can't leave. But yeah, I probably would be a lot happier without it. The days recently with the move and everything, there have been a lot of days where I'll wake up, jump on social media, maybe pop off a bunch of tweets, and then I'm off for hours. And I mean, as long as you're doing something, you don't miss it. You know, I mean, we're promoting something. You know, we're promoting the show, promoting a sub stack. You're promoting your newsletter. You're promoting the school of life. That's what we use it for. Also to try and get the message out there and let people know that they're not alone, that there are people on their side who see that this regime is completely insane and you're going to have to find a way to fix it probably in your personal life first. And then you can worry about the politics, hopefully locally first, and then you'll move from there. But yeah, I mean, social media, I've said it so many times, especially in the last year that I wish I'd never got on it. I know people who haven't been on in like six or seven years, they like abandoned social media six, seven years ago. And they're so much happier than I. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely hear that. I absolutely hear that. But yeah, as you say, I think I am kind of stuck with it. But yes. But it says something about it says something about mankind that this didn't work out because it should have worked out. It should have been a great step forward for us as a species to have this kind of communication with each other. And it should have been an opportunity to exchange information and learn. And the fact that it isn't is yet another depressing reminder of how flawed we are. Now, let me say something else related to human beings being flawed. I'm sorry to be so red-pilled here. I'm or black-pilled, rather. I'm generally not, just because my temperament is too cheery for that. But last night on my Liberty Classroom site, I did a live Q&A with Professor Jeff Herbener. We were talking about economics. And I just said to him, Jeff, you know, if I were to ask you to sum up the state of the economics profession right now, you would probably tell me that it is just shot through with problems, like it's borderline hopeless. And then I said to him, what are the chances that economics is the only academic discipline that's like that? I mean, wouldn't that be, what are the odds that we just happen to be stuck in the worst one? And maybe it's just that instead of being dispassionate truth seekers, human beings have base motives that they bring to everything, including academic investigation. And maybe some of them like to be economists because they want to toady up to power. And being an Austrian economist is not the path to that. And so some people have base motives or they want the discipline to spit out results that justify their exercise of power. Maybe there's that. Well, so he said, and i sorry, I was so ignorant. I didn't know about this and I haven't even looked into it since then. So I might be misstating it. But Jeff said about 10 years ago, there was the replication problem in psychology. So the problem was researchers started going through 
published papers and trying to replicate the results in those papers, and they couldn't replicate a damn one of them. Oh, wow. And so it's all been BS. And so what? So where does the discipline stand now? So it's not just that we're too bad of people to be able to make Facebook a pleasant place to be. It's that we can't even be trusted with like reciting facts anymore. So I, I don't know what to think. I really don't. And yet I realize the elitism of trying to claim that I, however, am above all this and I'm a fearless truth teller. But I don't know, Pete, that is kind of how I think of myself. <laughs> well, when you were saying that, it reminded me of, I don't even know who the first person who did this was. It's apocryphal at this point that when they created like the first AI and let it loose within a day, it's talking about, well, humanity must be destroyed. You've heard that, right? Yeah. I think it's amazing that social media is created and within six months, this person's Hitler, this person's a Nazi, this person deserves to be dead. It's just the worst part of people comes out. I'm sure it has something to do with the anonymity, but also you can't only think that everyone on social media is being hyperbolic when it comes to things like that. So it really seems like it makes the worst in people come out. So the question is, do you want your kids on it? Well, if you know it's no good, <laughs> the question answers itself, really. And the funny thing is, when I first got on Facebook, I remember thinking, oh, this will be cute. When my kids grow up, we'll exchange funny posts together. The world was still that kind of, but that was still a world where you could put a video up on YouTube and the thought would never cross your mind that it would be taken down. Yeah. So in that world, it seemed, oh, that'd be fun. You know, we'll joke with each other on Facebook. No. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then Twitter comes along and it's like, I mean, it almost seems like some regime experiment to not only disseminate their propaganda and get it out in front of as many people as possible and communicate it to their apparatchiks, a way to get people to just go to war with each other. Yeah. And now, of course, there are a lot of people like you and me who don't accept the propaganda, but What's really amazing is, I mean, you would think the internet, it decentralizes everything. And so there'll be less tribalism in the sense of, I have to show everybody that I believe in such, a, you know, because everybody will have their own individual little causes and concerns. But to see the way people around the world immediately know the new signal is hold up the Ukrainian flag, or now it's a pride flag, or now it's a, a vaccine, or now it's a, everybody just knows this is the thing that I can signal to people that I am on the team. I am on the elite team with the rich and powerful because I am a pathetic individual who needs the approval of the rich and powerful, even though they hate my guts and would kill me in a minute, you know, <laughs> if it benefited them. Yeah. It's been amazing to observe. So I've actually even thought during COVID, I wondered, a part of me thought, thank God we had the internet because then at least we could get some dissident voices out there. And that probably may still be the correct answer. But the compliance, I think, was partly driven by just the ubiquity of the imagery everywhere you looked on your computer and the suppression of alternatives made people think, well, I guess everybody's doing this. Whereas you weren't sitting there wondering, I wonder what they're doing in France. Well, you knew instantly everybody's wearing a mask in France. And so it made it possible to get people into this mentality in a way it engineered consent, to use a Noam Chomsky in phrase, in a way that they might not have been able to do quite so readily in the old days. I think it's a toss-up now. I'm not convinced either way. I mean, yeah, if we'd still had three television networks, that would have been stultifying. But I don't know, maybe resistance would have expressed itself beneath the surface in some other way. I don't know. But I guess my point is, I thought the internet would be the dream come true for dissident voices. And to an extent, it still is. But to another extent, it can also be a tremendous instrument for enforcing conformism. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, I still just want to know about those videos of the people in China just falling over and dying in the street. Yeah. What was that all about? Yeah. All right. I want you to do something that you are absolutely the best at. You're the best at many different things. But promoting myself is absolutely the best. Absolutely the best at promoting yourself. So please <laughs> go ahead and do that. Okay. All right. Well, you taught me how to, I mean, you taught me how to do it. So no, thanks, Pete. Thanks, <laughs> Pete. Well, I guess the key thing these days, I've got a bunch of fun things coming up I'm going to be releasing. But right now, I still strongly urge folks to check out my book, National Divorce. It's in ebook form only. I think it's really good. 
chapter one, I really think will knock your socks off. And you'll know more about this than anybody you know. But I actually have it, believe it or not, at nationaldivorce.com. And nationaldivorce.com was owned by some other schmuck, I don't know who. So I couldn't just pay the 10 smackers for it. I had to pay, I had to pay for this thing. So please. Yeah, you told me I would pay it for it. And I think you're insane, but that's all right. I know. So please, people, <laughs> help me after the fact, make this a rational decision and go to nationaldivorce.com and get that book. It doesn't cost you anything. Just go get it. Well, I appreciate it. And for everyone tuning in to the Old Glory Club and the crowd is just growing more and more every day, we thank you for coming on and appreciate everyone watching this. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. I'll be home next week with some fresh episodes for you, and I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.